Hello and you're very welcome to the Women's Rugby Pod, episode 175. I'm Johnny Hammond alongside Sarah Bernard Burn and Sadia Kabea. Ladies, looking resplendent again this morning, Monday morning. Uh, great pod ahead of us, looking at the Wales squad. We're looking at the England under 20 squad. Some news from Australia we'll have a chat about. Uh, and we'll have a look back at the uh, the one and only fixture on the PWR last weekend and look ahead to a full round of fixtures this weekend as well. All the international news, as ever, with the brilliant uh, newscaster that we've got on board now, Rory. But ladies, how are we? Sadia, the new hair. We've got to talk about the new hair. That is magnificent. Uh, thanks, Ronnie. Thank you. Well, basically, I was going to do my own hair for two weeks and I was procrastinating for two weeks because I just couldn't be bothered. I couldn't, the thought of it made me want to cry. So then I uh, caved in and booked her out my head just up and got my head on. So now I feel lovely and refreshed and I feel like a new person. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my hair. So, so I'm feeling great because I have my hair done. You know when you don't have your, I don't know if you feel the same way, Johnny, but if you don't have your hair done, sometimes you just feel like poop. And now I've got it done, I feel on top of the world. So, yeah. Yeah, do you feel so the I... same way, Johnny? <laughs> um, what, 100%. <laughs> um, I'm in a transition phase, and that's why I'm wearing a cap. <laughs> Genuinely. Uh, Sarah, you get the same kind of feelings. I can't believe I'm actually having a task now. <laughs> feel good, but it's important, though, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, when we when we when we when we look good, and we think we think we look good. Um, yeah, we we feel better, and that's um, all part of it, isn't it? Yeah, I really love getting my hair done. I love all that stuff. I love getting my nails done. I love getting my eyelashes done. All all of it. It does make a massive difference, I think. If you're feeling like a little bit down, or like especially in like January, February, it's like so grey and dull outside. You've got to do things to brighten your day up. So, how how long does it take? Um, well, when I'm a hairdresser, it takes about eight hours, but if I was to do it myself, that would take a whole, probably about 14, because I have to eat, I have to nap, I have to watch TV, I have to procrastinate in between. So, yeah. You also sat in a hairdresser's for eight hours? Yeah, lots of snacks and lots of Netflix. Wowzers! That's a that's a lot of chat as well. Do, do you chat? Do you chat about when you're going on holiday and that kind of stuff? No chat. No, no, no. We don't. We don't chat. No. <laughs> wow. I'm not the biggest talker, but no. <laughs> I was going to say this time. <laughs> 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 And what are you up to the the weekend, Bernard? How's uh, how's the knee? I've seen you sort of getting out one of those sort of RoboCop type things. <laughs> yeah, I've been um, I've been able to walk a bit better this week, um, and I see the surgeon this Thursday actually. So hopefully I can come out my brace soon um, and start actually doing some rehab. But it's just got loads of fluid in it at the minute, which I'm not really allowed to get rid of. But I also can't do a lot because it's got fluid in it. So it's like trying to find a good balance of letting it swell, but not too much, so I can't do my rehab. So, no, it was all right. It was really nice, actually. My family came up at the weekend, um, which for my the swelling in my knee didn't do too well with two little boys running around, like, trying to, like, play, like, hide and seek, <laughs> um, particularly with the little ones, but ADHD, so he can't sit still for very long. So, um, but, no, it was really nice to see those guys, yeah. Ah. Oh. Some time with the little ones. How how lovely. Um, what what does a weekend look like the other day? Because obviously we've established we're we're in a in a hair salon for uh, in effect an entire day. What was the other day uh, on a weekend off look like for you, Sadia? Uh, I went to Brussels, hopped on the Eurostar, had a quick weekend away. That's cute. No way. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah, what did you get up to? Um, ate loads of waffles, uh, loads of chips, um, more waffles, uh, and then I saw a little boy peeing because that's what you have to see when you go to Brussels. There's a little mannequin that um, pees into a fountain, and it's like one of Brussels' like main attractions. So yeah, Samaritan <laughs> piss. There it is. Yep. Um, I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly. 
Um, yeah, the little boy being a <laughs> No, no idea what the significance is, but uh, yeah, you're quite right. So a bit of culture and um, being the chef, you are just t- tasting the sort of local delicacies. Yeah, you know me. You know me. I just have to. It's for it's it's more for um, education. You know, so I can take it back to to my kitchen when I get home. Not because I want to eat it. You know. No, obviously. And it's if you not got some waffles already, then. No, not yet. Not yet. Oh, come on, this week. And then you can send them around the place. Um, that would be awesome. Ladies, um, I've got a huge amount uh, going on in the, the world of women's rugby. I mean, it's still plenty, don't get me wrong, but um, not, 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 not a huge amount. Just, as I say, the, the one fixture from the PWR, which we'll get onto later on and, and then preview a full round of fixtures. Uh, but a bit of international news on the, the pod. Wales have announced their extended Six Nations training squad. Not a huge amount of surprises. What caught your eye, didn't catch your eye, Sarah Byrne? Um, I think seeing the return of um, Flip Flop, as, as they call them in, in the Welsh camp. Um, um, yeah, so um, Rebecca de Filippo. Is that how you say it? I really, I really know her as Flip Flop. So. Um, and then I think the the missing for me is the the big one is missing Shoneb. Um I haven't seen her name in the squad yet. And then the return of um who everyone used to refer to as Sheep as Shona Powell Hughes Hughes, but I think her, her name's changed now. So um yeah, I think it, there's a couple of people that you probably haven't seen for a, a while that have returned into the squad, which is kind of exciting. Um but also it is interesting to see that they haven't selected Shoneb as she this does play such a big role for them in their Welsh side. A few Sadia? Uh yeah, kind of just echoing everything that Berna said. Um and also Gony Heske being added to the world squad as well. Um she's been going well in, in the PWR for Bristol Bears, so I think it was only a matter of time until um someone picks her up, so quite exciting for her. Yeah, former England under twenties captain, um qualifies to a Welsh grandmother and the, the PWR doing favours for, for not just England but uh, multiple countries because uh, these kind of players are, are playing top level um, week in, week out. Yeah, Shona Powell Hughes as uh, we formerly knew her, now Shona Walkley who married Nick, the uh, GB7's coach isn't he, for the uh, the women's side. Uh, she's been ripping it up in the Celtic Challenge. Um and again, that Celtic challenge has, has unearthed a, a few players. Um, Australian-born, Welsh-qualified black rower Tess Evans, alongside scrum half Sean Jones, uh, Gwenan Hopkins as well. Uh, so there's a, a couple of new faces. This is, of course, the era post-L Snowsill. Um, and we uh, we spoke to Craig George, didn't we, um, a few a few weeks ago. Um how do you think Wales are going to develop? Where do you think they need to develop post? Well, the last time they were together was uh, WXV1, wasn't it? Which, um, in terms of results, was was an unsuccessful campaign. Yeah, I think um, Wales, I think that they always have a brilliant pack. Like, their pack is always incredibly tough to play against. You look at the start of most of their games, you have the likes of um, Greg Lian, you've got George Evans, you've got players like Alicia Butchers that... They're really hard to play against. Kelsey Jones, um, for me, I think where sometimes they kind of lose their way a bit is just that organisation in, in the backs line. So it'll be really interesting to see, um, like um, flaky has been playing so well for Gloucester, how they kind of all merge together coming back from their from the Premiership clubs and um, back in, into their Welsh side. Um, I think if they can, it'll be really exciting to see um, Flip Flop, if she's still playing 12, to be in that 12 row and, um, kind of see how they, what backs they pick, what combinations they use. Um, and especially if they get any of their GB sevens girls back, it'll be interesting to see where the likes of Jazz Joyce or um, Kaylee, Kaylee sit within that. Yeah, Kaylee, Kaylee Powell, the uh, the fullback. Um... I think you've got a player like Jazz who just creates something out of nothing. Like she can pick the most terrible decision and you'd think, why have you picked that? And she'll then make a line break and you're kind of like, 
okay, fair enough. Like, um, and this similar with like Kaylee. Kaylee's been um, rehabbing at Bristol, so she's coming back from her ACL, and she's been playing and training absolutely amazingly. Um, but then you've also got Courtney Keat who, again, is probably not your out-and-out pacer, but she is extremely robust, powerful, explosive sprinter that they haven't had bef- they haven't had for a while as well. So it's nice to see um, her back in the mix for Six Nations, hopefully, um, again, returning from her ACL. Um, so they have a lot of different options, but I think Jazz is just one of those, you know, once-in-a-generation play- once players that has just the pace, the power, the agility to just get out of tricky decisions and, and score some absolute worldy tries. Yeah, for me, definitely would be that organisation and their backline and, and how they organise in open play, which is normally down to their key playmakers as well. So relates to the back. But I think it'll be interesting to see how they use and develop the young players coming in because I think they've got quite a lot of young players now named in the squad um, and to see if they're going to play any of them, if, if many of them will, will get their first cap, but also if it, any, any of them can bring anything new to the team as well. So I think that will be interesting to see how well them develop and use those players. Up front, of course, Cecilia Tupolotu. Um, and the return, as we've seen over the last few weeks, of you know, that really experienced second row partnership um, of Gwen Crabb and Natalia John. Again, I had Natalia on a few weeks back. Um, but great, great to see them back. You know, Gwen Crabb is a, he's a fine, fine athlete, isn't she? Uh, a, a great Great second row for them. They have been sort of filling in with George Evans and whatever, who will give 110%, but um, having those second rows back will will make a big difference, I would suspect, to to the line-out as well. So, um, Wales in, in decent shape for for the Six Nations. Um, there's now two Perths in the team, Gwen and... Alu. Alu. Yeah. Alu Perth. I don't know, though. I don't know. You could probably just... <laughs> but I have heard that, apparently, if this is her younger sister, I think they've come from a really big family. So if this is one of... I think it's her younger sister, who apparently is a giant, like a tall, strong, like farmer, farmer strength. I think it's going to be really good for you, for them. I think it's someone that I know um, Eleanor Snowsill used to speak about quite a lot. Um, if it if it is that if it is the particular sister that I'm thinking of, um, then I think it, they, that could be really exciting for Wales as well to have someone who ha- has the height and the ability um, to like have that power and strength that that Gwenny has. Um, it'll be exciting for them because they always say to us, "Oh, how do you get all these tall giants in your team?" And we, <laughs> I always say, "Oh, they're from the north. We don't know. <laughs> they're all from the north." So. Um, they they don't understand how we get like the likes of Abby Ward, Zoe Oldcroft, Emily Scarrett, um, Kath O'Donnell. So it, for them, I think it's really exciting if, if they have if it is um, if it is the right pairs. Yes, uh, indeedy. So um, that 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 is exciting because yeah, it, it's been an area which has needed uh, with the greatest respect refreshing. Um, the, the 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 prop situation in in the Wales team, I think that's that that's fair to say. Um, you know, some old stages done a done a brilliant job for for many a year, but it's just an area need refreshing. And also, modern props. You tell us, Bernard, aren't scrummaging and lifting in a line out and uh, and at restart, it, you're expected to do a hell of a lot more. So the the fancy dance in the back row can just whiz around doing their thing. Yeah, I think. Um kind of now it's particularly in the women's game it was more seen as oh you they can do this as well I think it I think it's incredibly hard I think if you're playing in a game that has uh both brilliant packs a brilliant front row you're gonna lose those elements because the scrum absorbs so much energy from your front rowers so the harder um the scrum is the more concentration the more the more amount of scrums you have that element of the front row that is a bit more um, expansive will kind of get zapped out of those guys just because there's there's nothing. You could be the fittest person in the world and you could not do 24 scrums and still sprint around the pitch. It just doesn't work. Um, but I think, yeah, to see the lights of more and more kind of um, that athletic props coming through and the ones that can make line breaks and also ball handlers as well, it, it just adds such a big dimension to every team. If you have a front row that can handle and make dominant carries, um, for every team, it, it adds another ball carrier, which again is 
harder to defend. So um, it's so exciting to see the likes of um, like these players coming through and hopefully they'll th- thrive in the Six Nations. Sorry, again, with the greatest respect, who are the three players in the Welsh back row you don't want to come up against in the Six Nations, potentially? Mm. Oh, we have Beth and Lewis, Callender, Georgia Evans, I was going to Shona Walkley, um, Alicia Butchers, Joyce. Uh, I've actually never played against Alicia Butchers, but I've seen, well, only in the Prem. I've never played against her internationally, but I mean, I think her performances um, speak for herself. Um, so I think she's definitely someone who I'd be. Um, probably excited to play but also yeah kind of wary of what, of what she can do so definitely Alicia Butchers definitely Alex Callender I think that's probably first than every forward would say not <laughs> just the back row uh, just because she's typical seven you know out and out noise around the breakdown and she does her job really well so it makes it quite hard for another back row um especially those who who like to go over the breakdown as well so definitely Alex Callender and I would say, I think George Evans too, it's whatever she's playing, she's in the back row or the second row. She's pretty similar to Alcal, but I think she's a bit more of a ball carrier, um, but the same, the same kind of uh, noisiness, um, just all, all over the, all over the pitch. But I think in the back row, it's not, well, people you kind of fear playing, I don't really like playing, are the ones that are annoying. <laughs> Yeah, because which is you know, I think as a as a back row, if you're called annoying, you're kind of doing your job right. I don't know if I've got the annoying the annoying title just yet, but <laughs> um, yeah. So those three definitely. There's still time, Sadia. <laughs> no, well, that was what the, the the question was kind of kind of directed at because they are in your face, put you off your game any way they can, and and have been successful, especially against England. Um, Last few years, certainly for patches of, of games, certainly starts of games, um, certainly hit, hit you red roses um, off off your stride. But um, yeah, it, it's a it's a strong Welsh squad. Looking forward to seeing what um, they can do come the uh, come the Six Nations. I am Shona Pell Hughes, and you are listening to the Women's Rugby Pod. Those wanting to potentially play in the Six Nations, the full women's Six Nations at some point are the under-20s players. Um, England have announced their sort of training squad. LJ Lewis, formerly of Wasps, of course. Lovely person, really good coach by all accounts. is being helped out. Let's get into coaching first by Sarah McKenna. Is she going to make a, a, a good coach? Is she, is she tailor-made for coaching, isn't she? Yeah, I think McKenna's gonna be gonna be great in that in that role definitely. Um she played a big role in, in England with, you know, being that hat girl, um, like organising all all our fun stuff and getting people involved. So from a coaching point of view, she's great at, you know, keeping everyone engaged, um, having everyone in the same place and on that same mindset. So I think from that point of view, from what I've experienced with her, she'll be great and I'm sure um those under twenty girls are gonna have not only a fun time, but also, you know, have someone who has loads of experience playing um, international rugby um, and premiership rugby um, coaching them as well. So I think those are two two great things that will probably, yeah, make her a good coach there. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, McKenna's also had experience in the seven field as well as in the 15. She's played for a long time. She's played a few different positions in the backs. Um, she is just a bundle of energy. Some of the funniest socials or things I remember has been led by Sarah McKenna so um, she's just going to be I think she'll be really passionate and just have that really positive energy that um, that will just encourage the girls I think when you're in under 20s you can get kind of caught up in oh I want to play for England I want to play for England now and actually a lot of the time it's just enjoying and learning what you're doing and trying to you know meet different people get different opinions of different coaches things like that so I think she'll be great for that and I do think They'll probably be one of the funnest 20s camps that will ever have been. <laughs> it is hype manager an actual title? <laughs> Self-proclaimed? No, no, no. I think she would have it. She would have hype manager. <laughs> Connor, what, what's the hypiest thing she's she's done? You said you, uh, this is, I know certainly in, in New Zealand, she was sort of almost, as you say, like in charge of, 
and keeping you guys on the straight and narrow mentally and whatever um and doing games and what have you and, and thinking the things up what what are the best kind of stuff that McKenna's done and the under 20s can expect <laughs> I, I, I was on the land from McKenna as long as Burner, but I remember obviously in uh, New Zealand, the World Cup, her organising the Halloween social, which was basically a, um, what, what would you call it? Another horror Haunted maze. house. A horror, horror maze, house. yeah. <laughs> which was which was a lot, a lot of fun. Um, uh, and she put everything into that. It wasn't just like your like B-Tech, like decorations. She was acting, there was people in suitcases. There was, you know, uh, screams getting played as you walked through through the through the maze. So yeah, that was uh, probably one of the best things that I remember McKenna doing. Yeah, there's a lot of things, but I'm not sure they'll be allowed on the podcast. <laughs> but, right. Um, okay. One of, yep. uh... one of the other things is um, I remember when we were building up after COVID to play against New Zealand. It was quite daunting. Um, and she just kind of brought in like these balloon animals. And she was like, right, we're going to do balloon animal making just in the middle of dinner. And everyone was just sat like eating, like trying to make like dogs and bunnies out of these like, balloons. And it was really funny. And it was just kind of more little things like that. She was in charge of our kind of, we used to have a thing called Compete to Win. And she was in charge of leading that and making sure that everyone kind of got involved with something. A lot of people would be like, oh, force fun. But I think they're kind of some of the funniest times you end up remembering. Um, so she's just a really good, like, people person, team person. Um, and just, yeah, she, she'd she be great to, to have around in that in that squad. And Bernard, in, in terms of the players, has she got to to coach and, 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 and present and, and get, to, get to a decent level, uh, continue their development? Um, who Springs out to you that uh, under under twenty squad. Um, I for me it's going to be Renika Bonner. She is going to be a ferocious player. I think she is strong. She is unbelievably quick, and um, and there's a lot of unbelievable quick people at Bristol on those wings. So, um, yeah, and she is also just the funniest, like down to earth person. I've kind of ever met there's a really nice little group of them at Hartbury I mean at Gloucester at Bristol that go to Hartbury as well oh I'm gonna get in trouble there um but that uh yeah and she's just lovely she's always really happy like happy to chat just kind of gets her stuff done um but yeah I think she's gonna be brilliant so I'm really excited to see her she's had a few um kind of tasters of premiership rugby um I think she's still got like quite a bit to learn but in terms of raw talent yeah she's definitely one to keep an eye on for me, I think, obviously I have to shout out my Luffer girls, there's quite a few Luffer girls actually in the Uncanny squad, but um, I think definitely Lilia Campion, uh, obviously she's a transition player uh, for England as well, but I think she's been going well in the Prem, she's been in the Prem for quite a while now, um, so I think since she was maybe 17, I think 17, um, and she's been leading that line out well, obviously she's up against some tough competition, like some Zoe Allcroft, Abby Ward, but I think she's, um, you know, been kind of uh, taken away um, behind the scenes and I think just from what I've seen in the PWR um, I'd go with Amelia McDougall as well from Saracens obviously Sorry Harrison's been out unfortunately with a few injuries uh, I think she's stepped up to the best of her abilities and from what I've heard and seen she's been doing a good job of it so yeah definitely Amelia McDougall and Lily as champion Yeah McDougall really good uh, good shout yeah um Lucky enough to comment on a, a couple of Sarah's games, and she's um, she's been playing playing very well. Um, Grace Clifford, uh, another one of the transitional players, um, unavailable selection due to to injury. But yeah, there's so many players. I think eight or nine that um, you know, are playing to a pretty pretty regular rugby in the PWR, um, which you know is a is a is a cracking standard. You know the sort of headliners would be uh, Ella Cromack, Harlequins, sort of fly half. Um, I definitely think she's got a very, very bright future ahead of her. Millie Hyatt as well has been been turning out for Gloucester Harbury, hasn't she? Um, Neve Swales at, at Sale, been getting plenty of game time at, at, at Hooker. Um, so yeah, there's some uh, Tory Sellers as well at uh, at Saracens. Uh, it's a very, very strong squad, and they will go on to play the Army on the 23rd of March at Haven't up as five kickoff. France under 20s on the 20th of April. Venue and kickoff 
TBC, as is the game on the 4th of May against the Wales under-20s women's side as well. Regular under-20s fixtures, more rugby, more opportunity. Grow the game. Thumbs up. The other international news comes out of Australia. It's a massive win for, for the players. Is it, lady? Does that um, does that warm the cockles? Um, yeah, I think it's super positive news um, for for the Australian camp um, to finally be getting those those contracts through, and um, from what it looks like, good good sign of the contracts as well. Um, I think Australia have been coming from going from strength to strength over the past couple of seasons, and the way they've been playing, the talent that's, that's been coming through, they have every right to have these contracts now. So I think yeah, super positive for them. Um, and hopefully that just sees Australia carry on going, going on from strength to strength. Obviously, not the best for England because they're kind of <laughs> chasing, chasing the tails. But I think for international rugby in general, it, we've seen that over the past couple seasons of, uh, coming through with Wales as well. It only makes these squads better. So, yeah, uh, very, very positive. Yeah, I'd have to agree with Sards. I think... That's a that's a good wage in women's rugby to, to have that. It's um and considering, you know, they they were in the higher tier of um WXV, but sometimes they lost out to, you know, the likes of Australia and New Zealand and Canada and stuff like that. Um I think it's a really, really positive sign to the pushing it'll keep pushing the top nations as well to keep increasing and investing in their women. So I think that's really brilliant and positive to see. And the fact that they've now got forty five players that is also incredible. Like that is going to add so much depth and strength to that squad. Um, so if key players are missing, they're going to have someone to step in, um, which again really helps in those harder games where you can't rely on everyone to be fit. Um, you can't rely on those players if they're gone. So you you need to have someone to step up into that role and it not be uh, too disruptive to the team. So it's amazing to see that. Um, and yeah, I think it's great for women's rugby. It's um, and it'll just keep pushing, pushing everyone through to keep getting better, keep producing more. And the tournaments will get harder and harder. I mean, they're already really hard right now. <laughs> but I think um, I think it, it'll be great and it will be become a really entertaining spectacle where you do not know who will win. Um, I think we're on the brink of that now. But I think as more clubs, uh, more teams get paid more and there's more investment, it will come a time where you really don't know who's going to win. And it, it, you guys have been in it. You know, I'm sure it's great fun winning 374 games in a row, um, which is what you did going into into and, and through that World Cup. But actually, that's not good for the sport in general. Um, you know, it's about attracting eyeballs and, and people to watch the game. And you know, lots of studies have shown that it's actually about the more competitive games are the ones that you know, people remember and, and want to go back and, and, and watch. So, um yeah, he's pulling up those standards, and fair play to the RFU. Almost embarrassed these nations to 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 put some proper investment in. We've seen it with uh, South Africa, uh, Lynn Cantwell waving her wand down there. We're now seeing it in Australia. Joe Yap involved. And before I just ask you about Joe Yap, I'll, we'll just fill out um, some meat on the bones of the new deal uh, in layman's terms: two-year agreements on offer for first-time contracts. A uh, number of top tier contracts from 15 to 23 with the possibility of increasing that number throughout the course of this year, 2024. Players contract at the highest tier. They can earn up to 72,458 sure dollars per year and in Rugby Australia payments for Wallaroos and Super Rugby Women's. That's an increase of 28% from the max of $56,000 in 2023. And total up to 45 players, 10 more than last year, contracted across the three tiers with opportunity for additional players to be invited into the squad to aid player development. Joe Yap, um, I suspect, will have needed to see stuff like this certainly written down, if not signed, sealed and delivered, but wanted to, to see this kind of stuff before that she would have committed to to taking on the role. You guys come across Joe Yap, and and if so, um, what exactly have Australia got? Yappy was my under twenties coach for I think the last season and a bit, or or um, to be fair, it might have been more my. 20s. I was so in and out with twenties, I can't <laughs> can't always remember who's there. Um, but yeah, Joe Yappy was there for a long time, um, and yeah, she's lovely. She's really. Um, She's really calm. She's very collective to herself. But I know a lot of listening to a lot of the Worcester girls and a lot of the girls who had Yappy um, 
a, a while back, like Amber Reed and Emily Scarrett, they all love her. They absolutely love her. I think they think she's really down to earth. She really cares about the players. So I think, yeah, definitely for her to take this role, it would have been incredibly hard for her as a person and the coach she is to try and care and look after all these players when they're spread across Australia. I think she needed them to be you know, well looked after by the union. She needed to know that the union was going to support her and her team um, before she yeah, could really kind of take that up. Otherwise, I think it, it would have been really hard for her. Um, so I think this is brilliant. I think it's a great opportunity. And um, they've got someone who will be there to push women's rugby and continue to strive for success, but also just help them get on and be, understand professionalism and someone to support them around that because that can be a really hard transition as well. Yeah, full credit to the, the Wallaroos. Yeah, they, they came out very strongly, didn't they, um, on social media and said kind of enough is enough. But um, some really positive stuff. Julie Collins heading up um, Women's Rugby in Australia. Got Joe Yap now got um, all these contracts uh, and agreements in place and it's only positive stuff. If only we were able to speak to one or two of them. Uh, Caitlin Leaney, the second Wallaroo to leave Harlequins. Certainly a frontline player. Um, spent a lot of time on the on the bench, but the young second row, back row, an outstanding World Cup, very good WXV1. Um, she's off to New South Wales Waratahs. What are New South Wales gaining? Yeah, no, I think Caitlin Leaney, she was... A real key part of Harlequin's pack, uh, especially last season. Um, definitely someone teams would identify and ID what her, her strengths were. She was great in the line out and leading that line out. And I think it's around Park, um, a really prevalent, you know, player on, on the team. So yeah, a huge loss um, for Harlequin's. And I know towards the well, this this season she's been taking that seat on the bench, um, which. You know, for me as well, was a surprise um, because, I, I, like I said, she's such a key player for Quinns and has been. Um, so, yeah, definitely a huge loss for Quinns, especially in that line now. Um, obviously, they do have other second rows there who can lead that, but I think Caitlin was um, really good and, and instrumental there. Um, and so I think, yeah, a, a really good signing for New South Wales. And here's Glory with all the news from around the world. I'm Kate Zachary, and you are listening to the Women's Rugby Pod. Thank you, Sadia. It's good to be back. I'm Marie Taylorson from the Valkyries at Wave Ridge Vandals. Here's this week other news. We start in France. The Elite R Feminine played out round seven at the weekend. Pool one, Leo lost at home to ASA Rogmana, 9.38. It was a huge win for Stade Baudelaire, the champs putting on 87 points on Stade Francais with no response. Montpellier racked up a 52-7 win over Bobogny. In Pool 2, Lyon lost at Toulouse, 33-7. It was a tight one between Pirate and Stade Brené, 18-20 it finished to Stade Brené. And at the foot of the Alps, Grenoble beat Blagnac. 18-23, which all means in Pool 1, Stade Baudelaire extend their lead at the top. Seven wins from seven, with 33 points. ASA Rogmana and Montpellier on 29 and 25 points respectively. Similar in Pool 2, Stade Toulouse faultless, seven wins from seven, on 33 points. Blagnac in second, on 24 then Grenoble on 19. This week sees Rogmana host Stade Baudelaire. Lille travel to Bobogny and Stade Francais and Montpellier go head to head. Pool 2, Stade Toulousain go to Stade Brené, Blagnac entertain Paul and Lyon go up against Grenoble. The playoffs in the Celtic Challenge got up and running at the weekend. Glasgow lost to Britain Thunder, 17-24 while at the High Stadium in Edinburgh, it ended 26 all between Edinburgh and the Wolfhounds after the Irish side scored two late tries. So they stay top on 27, with Edinburgh behind on 23. So this weekend, it's Gwalior Lightning hosting Glasgow at 
and the All Irish Clash between Moorfans and Clovers kicking off at 4:30 p.m. with both of those games at the Kingspan Stadium in Belfast. Tunisia have won the Arab Rugby Sevens for the third year in a row. The expanded tournament to eight teams still finished up with an unchanged first, second, third, and fourth. That's all this week. Back to Sadia, Berna, and Johnny. See you next time. So there was only one game at the weekend. It was Gloucester versus Sale. Um, I think it was a tighter game than, than we all expected. We had Tales on the podcast last week saying that Sale were really up for it. Um, and the final score for that game was 28-3, um, with Gloucester having a really dominant scrum as well, I believe. Yeah, and then that's some bounce-back ability. You can only try and get better each week, can't you, Sartre? And, you know, 64 by, I think it was against Exeter the week before, six days before. Um, you know, our emotions were running high, as we heard from Tales, you said, Bernard. Um, but that's that's a good result against the champions. Yeah, I think that was a, a really good result for, for Sal. I think when you're in a bit of a rut and, you know, coming off a, a 64-5 loss to Exeter, um, 28-3 against the reigning champions is something, you know, that is a huge, huge improvement. Um, I think when you're looking at it from the outside, you might think 28-3s are still a big score. But I think for Sal, they're definitely taking away and chipping away at small, small things. And I think that's coming out clearly in their game, um, you know, leading 3-0 three, three up for it with a... Um, Penalty from Bitch Bitch Swagoni in the first in the first half for a solid amount of time. You know that's that's definitely you know a great positive and to have a, a hold in that game. Um, even if they did come out with a, a loss in the end, they're definitely something's definitely clicking and working again. Um, and I, and I, you know I've been there at Richmond. We, we we used to get big scores and that, and then slowly we chip away down. And for us, that was huge, huge, huge winning. So I think for say it will definitely be be the same for them. Yeah, and I also think Gloucester, like, they had a bit of a choppy start to the season, had some games on, some games off, um, and now they've run in since Christmas. They have a game every week. That's really tiring, particularly with the injuries that they have. There's a big chunk of the team um, who have picked up things here and there. Um, And also now Six Nations is building up. You're losing some of your players in the week to Welsh camp, Scottish camp, all different types of camps are going on. So I think Gloucester are probably just feeling a bit battered at this point. Everyone had a nice rest week and less they, ha- they had another tough game. And because they are the champions, they do have a target on their back. Everyone wants to win. Everyone knows it's going to be hard. So they're, they're ready for it. Um, so I do think, yeah, although, the, you know, they managed to get the win and they're very good at doing that. I think they will start to feel a little bit bumped and bruised. I think... Um, I think they're having a little bit of a down day today um, and doing some social events. So hopefully they can you know, just build up that that team energy a little bit more and without the training aspect to it. Yeah, recharging the batteries. Yeah, they certainly kind of hit the, the power button, didn't they? Uh, you look at the the, the try scorers, the scrum, as you say, Bernard, was, was Dominic, Catherine Buggy, uh, Steph Els, uh, Alex Matthews, Kelsey Jones um, on the score sheet. Um, Sale getting a, a couple of injured players back as well. Molly Wright, um, flag of Victoria Irwin. Um, so good to see those players back because, yeah, they're, they're like us have got a, a fair few occupying the, the, the physio room. Um, so well done to Gloucester Hartbury. Now 10 from 10. The only unbeaten side in the PWR top of the table, obviously. This weekend, two games under the lights. On Friday night, Leicester up against Ealing Trailfinders. Where is that going to be won and lost, Sadia? I think previously we've spoken about Ealing Trailfinders being really good offset piece. Um, that's where most of their tries come from, first, second phase, offset piece. Um, whereas I think Leicester are quite good um, off broken play. Um, you know, with the likes of Meg Jones um, in there, I think they like to take quick taps here and there, and a lot of their tries come from, you know, either wonder efforts from, you know, individuals or just really good link play off broken play. So I think each team have really separate strengths. Um, so I think it will, each team will actually have to, it will be one on who does the best kind of analysis on their team and the best prep during the week because they play so differently 
it's kind of hard to try and match up those strengths or match up those weaknesses. So you know, the perhaps the best and on on a day is able to problem solve on the pitch. I think will come out with the win because they are yeah two very different sides in, in how they in how they play. It's fascinating, isn't it? Brand brand new clubs and, and approach it so completely differently. It's uh it's incredibly interesting. Well, and is it Amy Cocaine's back this week? I think back in the mix. Amy Cocaine is back, which will be wow. brilliant. Yeah, and I, I think Leicester potentially didn't have the set piece at the start of the season. Um, but do you know what? They've really come on. Their set piece is getting really, really good. Their scrums has been, you know, occasionally dominant. Um, and I think that actually it's probably going to be, I'm going to be a bit contradictory of Sardia here. I think it's going to be a battle of the packs. I think you've got a very similar style of, um, your backs with how you play. They play a rush defence. They're tr- going to try and mess up your ball or score those, like Saad said, those in- individual tries where I actually think it's going to be whoever has the most cohesive pack who can get the best setup. And if you've got someone like Amy King coming back who can deliver that and is an explosive player as well, um, I probably, I'm going to have to say, I think Leicester might have this one this time. Ooh, she's going Leicester. Saad Kabea, where's your one virtual pound going. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna go with Leicester as well actually. Are you? Mm-hmm. Two for Leicester Tigers the Amy Cocaine effect. <laughs> that but also they have been going well. They've been going from strength to strength obviously. Last well, round unfortunately lost to them but they they put out a really, really good performance. Um so I can definitely see them um taking the win against Ealing. Went to watch uh, England uh, train uh, on Friday. Uh, the the men uh, lucky enough to to wheel up into the into the museum and a few of the boys and and, and their mates. And uh, I thank the guys there very much for for allowing us to do that. Uh, and we were going through all time fifteens, uh, men and women. And I had Amy Kikana hooking the boys. Oh, no, don't be ridiculous! I I think she's a phenomenal, phenomenal rugby player. And the fact she turns up in slippers, and then <laughs> I. Mean, if she ever gives up, when she gives up rugby, she goes straight to darts, can't she? Unbelievable arrows. Anyway, that's my little... <laughs> you might do it. It's better, it's better bonuses, isn't it, if you win darts? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> well, yeah, certainly. Um, <laughs> quite possibly. Uh, so, Amy, can you back? You two are going Leicester. I'm, uh, I'm going to go Ealing T. Uh, Bristol. Hosting Loughborough. Glad you two are apart. How are the preparations going, Sadia? They're going well. Um, I think last time we've had a bit of a... I, I've never, ever complained about breaks. I'm not complaining. But we've had, you know, one game on, two weeks off, another game on, another week off. Um, so I think it's kind of hard, you know, getting back into the group of things. But um, obviously, we, after taking the loss against Leicester, I think there's been, you know, a new fire kind of in the Loughborough camp. Um, and everyone's kind of, Really focused coming into this Bristol game. You know, it'll be a great game. Um, Friday night lights. Uh, hopefully, a really good crowd. Um, so I think we're all really up for the occasion, and we know, you know, Bristol have been going well, but it's kind of, you know, there's a little bit of a, a fight for that 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 uh, top four position now. So I think it'll be, yeah, really really good. But preparations have been going, been going well. Where can Bristol get the better of uh, Loughborough Lightning and Sardia's back row, Bernard? <laughs> um, I think avoiding uh, Sadio's chop tackles, that's the first one there. Um, I think um, for, for Bristol, I think it's more about keeping the control of the game and playing how they want to play and not letting Loughborough kind of <clears throat> disrupt that um, as much as I think Loughborough will want to. I think the whole Loughborough, I think if I was playing Bristol, it would be try and disrupt disrupt them um, and I think as long as Bristol kind of stick together they stick with their processes um, it'll be a really a really good game it is at Ashton Gate it is at Friday night um, and I think we've had a week off people feel kind of rejuvenated they have gave the girls Thursday off so um, they're going back in this week really hard hitting um, so yeah it'll be really exciting to see um, and I, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to win, but I am. I'm going to back Bristol because I always back Bristol. So, yeah, I think it will be an, an exciting game. I do think there'll be a decent crowd there as well. Ashton Gate is is a good crack. So, yeah. Uh, and are you back on the back on the radio? Back on the mic? 
yes, I am actually. I'm doing doing radio again with BBC Bristol. Um, so they didn't think I was terrible, <laughs> no, um, which I'm really excited about. So yeah, I need to get stuck in with um, some analysis. So Sadi, you got any any good information? Let me know. <laughs> I, halfway through that question, I was like, oh, no, perhaps they haven't asked her back. And that's going to be really awkward. <laughs> um, well, look, if you're an analyst, because it, it is on here, then, uh, yeah, of course, they've uh, they invited you back. So, yeah, BBC uh, BBC Bristol for Berners commentary uh, on that one. Presumably, Bernie, you're going Bristol. Presumably, Sadi, you're going Love for Lightning. You will be right, Johnny. Um, it's going to be a 28 all draw. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, on Saturday, <laughs> I'm not getting in between you two. Um, Saturday sees Harlequins travelling to Exeter. That's one o'clock for that one. Uh, Sunday, it's sail uh, back at Gloucester Hartbury. Um, let, let's look at uh, Exeter Harlequins. Um, Sandy Park is a great place to play, but not a great place to play. Um, uh, are we are we seeing Exeter or has there, there been enough in the last few weeks from Quinns to say that they will challenge uh, a top four side? No, I think Exeter. I think Exeter at home with the crowds that they get, um, with how they finished against Sale, I think they want to show their dominance. I think they will win. I think Quinns, they've been very up and down. I think Quinns, it's hard to say, kind of, it's kind of more see how they are in the day. Um, but I just think with how X to play, like they have a really good set piece, they have a good scrum, they have a good structure, they have a good kicking game. I think it will be difficult for Quinns to to do that. I think unless they just focus purely on that defensive, get them out, of, get them in the right spaces, get them out of their danger zones. Um, I think, yeah, I do think X to will have this one. I think it will be quite comfortable. Sorry, sorry, Arla Quinns. Obviously, Quinns, you know, they've had um, some positive results. Um, but I think Exeter are such a stable side, um, and not even not even just stable. They've been they've been, you know, getting better week on week um, with really really strong results. And they're a team that works really well on their um, their setup, and everyone knows what they're doing. And I think every time they perform, they're kind of like a weld oil machine. Um, so unless Harlequins are able to kind of like put a a stop to that, I think Exeter will carry on the way they have been um, and, and get a good win over them. But, you know, still props to Quinns, you know, you, there's definitely been, you know, things getting better in, in that camp, but I still think it'll be, yeah, a same with Bernard, uh, a good Exeter win. And Exeter now, oh, what, 38 points. So, you know, a win would be helpful, wouldn't it? Because Bristol, you're seven points to win 31. Um but obviously, Exeter can look up as well to Saracens on forty-five points. So, yeah, just got to keep keep those points ticking, ticking over for Exeter. But we're we're all going Exeter to beat Harlequins and Gloucester Harbury against Sale. Odd that it's back to back. Last week, uh, the the twenty-eight-three was a a replay of the game that uh, got called off early in the season. Uh, are we expecting this similar kind of? result and slash winner potentially but I, I think also Gloucester will be a bit annoyed with that result maybe so I don't know if we'll see a, a reaction from them but I think also say you'll have literally just played them so they know exactly what to do what to review so I'm torn between will Gloucester come back like this fiery team that have been a bit annoyed and rattled or will it actually be close again because say will sit down do their homework and like go to go to battle again so um, I'm unsure, but I'm, I am going to think. I do think Gloucester will win just because they're very good at winning, even if it's the last minute. I think probably it'll be a similar score. Um, definitely because you can only really play with what you got, and Gloucester still are missing quite a few of their players, and they're still playing with quite a young, um, young team. Um, but I think definitely if they'll go back um, and do their analysis, then kind of see where where they can, um, you know, get a bit more of a foothold into the game. I think obviously in the in the backs, Gloucester have a really young back line, um, and I think maybe other teams haven't haven't really analysed that yet. So you know, it'll be interesting to see. But I think yeah, still going to go with Gloucester to get the win. Um, but yeah, maybe Sal could get a few more points on the board. Yeah, I, I just feel Gloucester have another gear to go to at the minute. 
uh, and that's you know, not taking anything away from from sale. Um, we heard from the the horse's mouth uh, last week. And, you know, long term project. The local girls, young girls. You know, the average age was about twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. But that kind of mark at the minute. Uh, these these young girls getting lots of experience. So we, we all go Gloucester for that one. We must just uh, just touch on a sale making a history making fixture. Uh, yeah, which Sales told us about last week. They're playing Ealing Trailfinders at the Salford Stadium Saturday, the 9th of March, 2 o'clock. It marks the close. International Women's Day celebrations as part of Northern Rugby Matters campaign. It certainly does. Full support for that one. Do, yeah, get your tickets out on 9th of May. Oh, sorry, 9th of March, uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, yeah, just go to the Sale website to grab your tickets for that. That's about it for another week. Uh, do get yourselves down to the grounds if you can. And the uh, the Celtic, Celtic Challenge games as well going on over the weekend. Quality of Lightning, uh, the Irish Clash um, at the Kingspan if you're around the Belfast area. Uh, any shout-outs for us, ladies? Sadio, you got any? Yes, one shout-out going to Lindsay O'Donnell, retired from rugby altogether after 20 caps. A very good World Cup in 2022 and a real stalwart for Western Warriors women. Yeah, retired from all rugby all together has uh, Lindsay O'Donnell. And yes, congratulations on um, winning out of Scotland and, and Worcester Warriors. Well done, her. Go well Friday night uh, behind the mic, Sarah Byrne. You won't want to go back to playing at this rate. You're in front of a mic more than you're in boots nowadays. No, I definitely want to get back to playing. I hate not being able to it's doing my head in <laughs> understand I think we've got that message loud and clear viewers uh, and <laughs> listeners Sarah Bam will be returning to a pitch to you, you as soon as she she, she can uh, Sadia um, we just seen you you're the cover girl for the fixture on social media with the new locks how, how are you going to protect the new locks uh, I'm going to return with my Gilbert scrum cap beautiful my beautiful garment <laughs> that will be be worn this weekend. Do notice the flowing locks out the back, ladies and gentlemen, as Sadia is putting in yet another bone crunching tackle. Uh, ladies, been an absolute pleasure. Thank you to you two. Thank you to Tom. Thank you to Vicky. Thank you out there for listening. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.